Hi, everybody. It's Kevin Raber, and I'm back with another conversations with him. I'm really proud to have Colin Pryor with us today. He's a photographer from Scotland uh, and um, a fellow that was on one of my workshops uh, made a suggestion that I reach out to Colin. And when I did and looked at some of the work that he's done and the books that he's published and uh, his accomplishments, I thought that it would be good that uh, we had a chance to talk together and uh, share together. Uh, by the time you see this video, we will have also published an article uh, by Colin and uh, I hope you catch it. The link will be underneath in the video and uh, I'll also link it in the article that accompanies this video. Um, so let's get kind of started here. Colin, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? What part of Scotland are you from and how did you get into photography? Well, I, I live in Glasgow and um, I have done all my life and it's uh, very close to the Scottish Highlands, which uh, has, has had a big pull and influence on, on my life. But before I started taking landscape photographs, I um, was very keen on underwater photography. Um, without knowing very much about photography, I might add, um, I bought a Nikon FM and an Icolite housing and uh, an Icolite substrobe and took it under the Scottish locks. Now, you've probably not been in the Scottish Lost, Kevin, but the visibility is not uh, exactly wonderful. And it forces you really to work on close-up subjects. Um, so you're shooting macro. And, um, you know, it was then a 55 micro Nikkor. And um, eventually I, I made a trip to the, to the Red Sea in 1980. And I, I was completely mesmerized by the visibility. I had a 20 millimeter lens under a dome port. And I always remember the first time we, we snorkeled out over the, the coral table there and, and duck dived down. And I got down to about uh, 30 feet and realized that I didn't have my demand valve in because I was so mesmerized by what uh, I was seeing, being in a giant aquarium. And um, that was uh, at Sharm el Sheikh, near Sharm el Sheikh. And back then in 1980, there was one hotel there in Sharm el Sheikh and some barbecue shacks. And now there's a, I've, I've not been since they've, they've developed it, but there's a complete city. And where we used to dive um, from when we were shore diving, there's hotels there with balconies and verandas and it's, just not what it was back then. It's been developed. And I, I suspect the result has been that the reefs have been degraded a great deal by the volume of humans in the water. Well, I think we see that all over the world, you know, places that, uh, you know, back in the early 2000s and so forth, I'd traveled to specifically in this case, Iceland. And, you know, you're the only one there. The, the roads were dirt and uh, you could go to a location and sit there for a few hours and nobody else would come by. And uh, I haven't been to Iceland for a couple of years. We are going back in 2022, but it's the same thing. All of a sudden, you know, now there's hotels, there's tourists, the roads are jammed. Uh, you have to make reservations a long time uh, ahead just to make sure you get a room somewhere where before you kind of just pulled up to a guest house and, you know, they had plenty of room. So the, the world changes that way. Unfortunately, I think that's just part of, uh, what we're seeing today, I think social media has a lot to do with that and so forth. But, you know, the underwater photography has just got to be brilliant. I, I had a Nicomos and I did a bunch in the Virgin Islands at one time. And it really is a, a different kind of world. So it must have been quite exciting. Are you still diving? No, uh, no, I, I, I gave that up. Um, it, it's a very specialized area of photography. And the appeal of underwater photography is much narrower um, than, for instance, landscape is. And um, um, in 81, I entered the competition just as a bit of a long shot. And I, I won best newcomer to underwater photography. And, and that, that really, um, that was a catalyst that, that, that changed my life. I thought, if I can do this underwater, um, I can do this topside. <laughs> because I knew I could a, see. I, I, I didn't know what sea was, but I knew I could see something. Um, 
So um, I left, I, I, I worked with my father. He was the sales director of an American company called Lincoln Electric. Um, they make welding plant, they're in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, they're the biggest manufacturer of welding plant in, in the world and, and consumables. And um, I worked in there as operations manager and, and I left very shortly after I won that competition and went offshore as a photo technician uh, in, on, onto a rig in the North Sea. And I was loading cameras and processing film for divers. So um, my plan was to become a, a, an underwater um, uh, a hyperbaric welder. I was going to become a commercial diver because back in 78, and I dealt with um, the, all the, the companies, um, you know, when I was in Lincoln, um, hyperbaric welders were earning um, $800 a day. And that, that was back in 78. Well, well, there you go. That <laughs> would get me out of photography pretty quick. <laughs> So, um, but when I got offshore, I realized why they were getting 800 pounds a day. And um, I, I mean, I, I, the air divers were on a very different rate. And, you know, I was being paid a, a similar rate to air divers for, as a photo technician. So I did that for um, just about 14 months. And, um, and you know, I, I didn't want to get trapped in the offshore environment. And I, I left and I, I set myself up as a freelance. You, you got into photographing landscapes. How did you, you know, move and transition from you know, underwater photography into, you know, the landscape photography? Because the, the projects that, you know, you're producing and, and have done in your images are, uh, you know, show that you've, you've, you've picked up the, the knack pretty well. <laughs> well, it was, it was a long process, but I set myself up as a, as a freelance and I began to get work from a group of ad agencies and, and, and I was getting great day rates um, for that. And, you know, I was shooting hotel interiors and engineering works and just all the types of um, commercial uh, photography that, you know, these agencies cover. Um, it was all below the line work. You know, they, they, they had the budgets then to go to London where big name photographers would work on their big projects. But I built that up and eventually got into events, um, trade exhibitions, and um, which was a very specialised area. And I had, um, I had a big volume. Um, I, I, you know, I used to, to, to work on 40 to 44 trade shows annually all over the UK. And I had four photographers that worked for me uh, on a freelance basis. So that really helped me uh, establish um, myself as a photographer. And in the course of time, well, it was really 10 years because I'd, I'd kind of, I'd part my ambitions as a, as a photographer um, to one side. And, um, you know, when I felt I had enough money and time to afford to develop a landscape work, I did, I did that. I bought a, a, a Linhoff 617 camera and shortly after um, I, I replaced it with a, with a Fuji GX67 because it was better for, for the, the type of work that I did. And I started to photograph the landscape of Scotland um, with that format, which no one had done before. And that gave me great exposure because that was such a new format. Um, you know, Linhoff developed that camera back in the 60s and no, it was used for niche advertising jobs, mainly in the States. And um, in fact, it was, it was an American photographer, um, Harry DeZitter, that shot um, a series of images with a 617, I think for UPS. And it was just that three by one format that, that lit my imagination. So I bought that camera and set about trying to capture the, the landscape of Scotland, which is very vertical with, with, with that wide format. And the, 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 the work became, it became very um, popular uh, with magazines and newspapers and, and it gave me great airplay um, in these early days. So I started to get exposure as a photographer for my own work rather than for the for the work that I was being commissioned to do, which is so important. Yeah, it was. That's it's always nice when you get a little surprise like that, and it's it starts working in your advantage that way. You know, it's a challenge I think for all professional photographers. You know, there, there's there's many excellent commercial photographers out there, 
that are doing a fantastic job and they're servicing their clients, but they're essentially living other people's dreams. And, and you know, as, as, a, as, a, as an artist, you've got to live your own dreams. But, um, you know, what some photographers don't understand is that you need to be able to afford um, to live your own dreams. You know, you can't do that when, you know, you've got to pay the bank manager. You've got, you've got to be able to afford to, to do that um, before you can start indulging what you want to do. Because if you want to make money, it's what other people want to give you money for, not what you want. Being in a rich environment, you started photographing that environment and, uh, you know, making some great images. But as you proceeded, if you were like everybody else, you needed help trying to understand whether your work is good or, you know, find somebody that's an influence to you. Um, who were the influencers uh, that led you to uh, the development of the style of landscape photography um, that you have now? Who, who, who pulled your buttons and pushed your buttons that uh, made you realize uh, what you needed to strive for? Because you are self-educated. You didn't go to school for photography, I guess, right? No, I, I didn't. I, I kind of learned in the hard way. In fact, <laughs> I won, as I mentioned, that competition and, and uh, I went to the university um, that, that um, um, taught uh, photography um, um, and I spoke to one of the lecturers there and he looked at my underwater photographs and he said to me, I, I wouldn't waste my time here. He said, I would rate you in the top three underwater photographers, so don't. But I don't know if it was good advice because I really had to fight um, for a lot of the photographic knowledge that most students will be presented with um, during the course of a degree. So I, I, in a way, um, I mean, it didn't do me any harm, but, um, you know, especially when I was printing, you know, with, with, um, you know, with chemistry, there was aspects of that that I just couldn't quite get right. Um, I just nuances. I mean, I had the process right. And, you know, I would go and speak to camera shops and they would point you at so-called experts. But once you had a, a chat with them, they weren't really able to answer your question. And once I learned, you know, what I needed to know, I realized that they weren't experts, you know, and, and you come across a lot of people at that in life that are so-called experts, the A. Yeah, a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but probably the single biggest influence uh, on my photographic career was Galen Rowell. And um, uh, I came across his work actually um, in my local library in a book called In the Throne Room of the Mountain Gods. Mm. Um, and he, he wrote that about the, um, uh, the American 1975 expedition to, to climb K2, which unfortunately failed. And he was actually one of the climbing members. And there was something about the, the, the photographs of that particular landscape that really uh, lit my imagination. Um, one image actually in particular of the Triangle Towers that really spoke to me so deeply, and I thought, I need to go and see that landscape one day. But um, shortly after that, um, in 19, I think it was 86, he produced uh, Mountain Light, and that was a tremendous um, book. That yep. really um, spoke to me just at the crucial time, um, at, you know, and as, as I was ascending as a, as a landscape photographer. And, um, I think um, he took his 35 mil Kodachrome images and they were all duped up to 10 by 8. So they got much better reproduction because, you know, this is what many people listening to this won't understand. You know, the reproduction and the scanning of a 35 millimeter image and the lithographic process, which was used to reproduce books and magazines, was not very sophisticated back then. I mean, if you look at the Sierra Club, who produced that 1977 copy of the, 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 um, in the throne room of the Mountain Gods, it's dreadful, the reproduction in it. I mean, it is, know, when you look back at that, it is. Plates are moving. I mean, you know, they've moved, the registers out. Um, so he, he had a big influence, and I, and, and I thought to myself, you know, I, I can take that 617 camera and I can go up 
and capture that um, you know early morning, late evening light in the mountains, which is is what I did. You know, I, I, I got off the road and climbed into the mountains. And you know, you've got to carry all that and camping stuff up there and food and, and, and tents and and uh, as well as as your photographic equipment. And it's no picnic, uh, as as you well know, Kevin. Um, so he he was a big influence. And um, but what I would say is, and, and other other observers have, have said this. Um, you know, I, I kind of recognised after I became a bit more experienced that. A lot of the book, a lot of the images in, in, in mountain light that spoke to me deeply um, were filtered. And, he, you know, and it was so counterintuitive of everything that Galen believed in, but he had that pink singray filter on so many of these pictures, <laughs> yeah. even on the picture of K2. Yeah. Um, and, and I've met an Australian photographer that thought exactly the same, and I've met another American photographer that has recognised that he was not capturing the, the, the real light in many of the pictures um, that was there. It was being falsified by that pink chromo filter or Singray filter. Yep. And that, I kind of feel, it, it, you know, I, I find that disappointing. Um, and the, the, the other photographer, who's, who's not very well known, um, <clears throat> was a Japanese photographer called Shinzo Maeda. And he published about 17 books in his career. And um, the, I've got <clears throat> three of his books, but the one that, that spoke to me most deeply was called Kamakoshi. And it's a national park in Japan. <clears throat> and what was fascinating ab ab about Shinzo Maeda was that um, he worked mainly with a Hasselblad um, camera. So a lot of his pictures are square and he, he used 5.4, um, I think he had a Lindhoff 5.4 and um, a range of lenses and occasionally 10 8, but it was mainly the Hasselblad. And, you know, back then, as you'll remember, Kevin, that the, the, you know, when new books come out, it, they were really fascinating because you knew the equipment that um, the photographer used, and you could see the the quality of reproduction in in the in the book. And um, but the other aspect of it, um, Shinzo Maeda, is um, that he also did quite a lot of intimate landscapes and a lot of landscapes with a two hundred and fifty mil lens and a Hasselblad, and. <clears throat> He, he kind of put on my radar screen this idea of the intimate landscape, yep. um, which, which I really love um, as much as the big landscapes. The general public don't love them as much, but they can be used uh, in the context of, 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 of a book. And, and the help, I kind of feel the help that instead of you looking at a view and another view and another view, if you get one of these intimate landscapes, it's got to be strong. Um, it changes the mapping of the mind mapping's different and it, it, it creates a, a relief within the context of the, the, the flow of a book. So he used um, a 250mm lens and he shot a lot of um, long lens um, images and you're getting that lovely compression, of course, with the medium format. Um, and he also took um, quite beautiful and elegant images within the landscape that are not macro shots, but they're, they're shot from about waist height or thereabouts. And um, they, they were probably the two main influences uh, in, in, in my early career, um, both these photographers. Um, and I've learned a great deal from them. And, you know, we all mimic what they do in a way, but it's, you know, we, we all learn from other photographers and we're influenced by other photographers. But the important thing is to find your own voice. It's finding your own voice that's absolutely crucial. Um, and that, you know, you, you read a lot about it on websites about style. Style evolves, but you need a vision. You know, you need, you know, and I go back to some professional photographers that are, you know, that are very articulate and skilled at what they do as, as you know for their clients and in a professional context context 
but they don't necessarily have, have anything to say ab about how they feel about the world. You know, they have not an underlying desire to, to, to make a statement, to make, you know, a big statement, um, which is, is what I think drives great photography. I, th I have to agree with you. I think <clears throat> there's a lot of people that photograph uh, a good landscape, but really don't go into the landscape with their soul to bring that back out in their photograph. I mean, it's very easy. Uh, as I said earlier, especially where you are, you can just stop along the road and you know find a pretty picture. You know, finding a pretty picture and 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 sitting there and understanding that photograph and that 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 spot, and then you know walking a little bit, finding that right rock in the foreground. You know, the wisp of a piece of grass, and you know, if if you do that, you begin to find the landscape talks to you. And this is my experience actually in Scotland and my some of my visits. And specifically, you know, when I got up into uh, Isle of Skye and, and on top of some of those mountains there where, um, you know, the light, the weather and, and the green and the, the, the whole thing was so dynamic that, you know, as it spoke to you and as, as it spoke to me, you know, I had to photograph it based upon you know, just not the snapshot, turn my head back and walk away that, you know, I sat there and, you know, immersed myself into that, that, that location and, you know, just witnessed the beauty, you know, the speckled sunlight coming through a cloud, you know, the snow blowing in front of the lens from where, I don't know, because I was having sunshine, snow and everything all at once and wind and, you know, what a remarkable kind of way of doing something. And, I see so many people today set their pie shot up, pie shot up, <laughs> set their tripod up, shoot a shot, and and not really you know think about um, what they're doing or actually feel what they're doing. A fellow UK photographer, Steve Gosling, is very much into you know how's it speak to your heart and what are you seeing and what's it saying and you know um, I try to mention this in my workshops of uh, contemplative photography and. Um, you work with a big format camera, and a lot of times when I work with a phase one camera or a large camera, it's not something you just put up to your eye and shoot. You know, you kind of have to set it up and, you know, compose and take your time and, you know, move into that landscape. And I think that's what sets images apart is the, the, the landscapes that the photographer has had the moments to involve himself in, maybe even have to come back several times until, you know, what he's seen or what he wants to see actually is there for him. Sometimes you luck out in the first shot too, mind you. Um, but I think that's really important. And I see that changing in today's uh, photography and kind of skipping ahead a little bit. I mean, I, you see this on your, your workshops, I suppose, too, and specifically with a lot of the tourism. You know, it's, it's so easy to take a nice looking picture today that, uh, you know, everybody's very proud of what they take, but it's not the same thing as, you know, some of the work that you've done along the way. Um, I don't know. I guess it's a changing time. I'm trying to deal with it myself. Uh, <laughs> but um, it's it's a different way of, of, of being. Um, I guess it's just like everything else. Time is moving forward. You know, we still have parts of our, our feet stuck in the back, though, in you know, the olden days. I, I, I think just going back to what you were saying there about um, immersing yourself in the landscape, I think, it's absolutely crucial that that photographers spend time in 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 one place, um, not in one location, but um, I'm, I, I'm, I've spent quite a bit of time in the Karakoram. You know, I've been going there for for six years, and you know, each time you go you go there, you might go back into the same glacier system, or you might go into a, a different one. But I've been there, you know, on these glaciers two or three times. And you, you get out there for a month, you separate um, from the white noise of, you know, running a business. Um, and after a day or two, you get into a rhythm and you're absorbing, ab you're absorbing all the time. You're listening, you're smelling, you're seeing. And this idea, and I see it often on, on blogs where the photographer's out and you know, all the elements are coming together and he puts his earphones in. Now, 
if you want to be a great photographer, you need all your senses switched on because yeah. we are distilling a, a feeling, a mood. It's what we feel. And you need all that, all that input needs to go in. The longer you're in that landscape, the better. But the problem today, Kevin, is, 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 as you well know, is, you know, it's such a challenge for professionals to make a living now that they don't have the time to immerse themselves in the landscape. You know, I'm fortunate, as you said, insofar as I don't live very far from the best parts of Scotland, I can get there in two or three hours, depending on where I want to go. Um, and, you know, over the course of my lifetime, I've got to know that landscape intimately. Um, you know, you learn, uh, uh, you know, what the light's like at this time of the year in January, you know, how little light there is, how low it is. It's, it's learning all these things. And, and, and if you don't learn that, you cannot produce work with depth in it. And that's what we're not seeing today. We're not seeing projects with depth because the photographers, sadly, don't have the time to indulge what they're good at. You know, these, you know, they're not making enough money to say, well, I'm going to take two weeks out and I'm going to go to wherever they're going to go and they're going to work on a long-term project. And I would still advocate that if they can. But it's far better, in my opinion, to go back to one area and create a body of work with depth rather than fly about the world and cherry pick, you know, six or seven different locations. Because, you know, with respect, uh, you're only going to get the same types of pictures that tourists are going to get. They might be better, sure. you know, right. better equipment, but better experience. But unless you commit yourself to that landscape, that won't happen. Let, let's just, you know, a lot of the, the tourists, I mean, the social media, people see pictures on social media and they, you know, they go to that spot because they want that same picture. You know, we used to call it, you know, standing in somebody else's tripod holes. But, you know, I, I want to go back to a, a long-term projects and uh, specifically a project that, you know, you've worked on. I mean, you've done some books and some amazing landscape work, but one of the ones that fascinates me is the, the Quercum. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, so tell me just a little bit about this. First off, it's not the easiest access area. It's a beautiful mountain range and you've published a book on it. So let us know how you got interested in that, how you proceeded to, to do that. Were you ever scared? You know, what was going on there? And um, eventually where and how you got this published. Um, and this is a project, obviously, you, you sunk your soul into and you spent a long time there disconnecting, as you would say. The Karakoram uh, is, is a range of mountains in northern Pakistan. Um, and there, there are, there's no security issues in, in northern Pakistan. It's Gilgit Baltistan. Um, and uh, the border with Afghanistan is in the northwest. So I'm not really in the, the tribal areas uh, of Pakistan that are bordering with Afghanistan. That, um, from a security, po a security point of view, would be a little bit more challenging. But I've never had any security uh, in, in northern Pakistan. But the initial um, inspiration for the Karakoram came, as I mentioned earlier, um, from Galen Rowell's book in the throne room of the mountain gods. And um, if you looked at that book now, you probably would be thoroughly unimpressed because of the reproduction of print. But uh, it's, um, it, it really captures um, the character of the mountains. And that was, they lit a little light in my mind that has never gone out. And I went there first um, in 1996 uh, when I was working for British Airways. And I had a commission um, which took me out uh, to that part of the world, and that was my first taste of it. And um, I went back on, on, a, on a private expedition in 2004, and there, thereafter I, I managed, I, I wanted to produce a body of work there, and, and re I realised that uh, the only way I was, I was going to manage to do that was to find commercial sponsorship. So, uh, you know, I produced a full color brochure. I got a copywriter and I sent the brochure out to the brands, uh, the photographic brands and the outdoor brands. 
And I, I went to exhibitions, trade shows to see them. I went to Fotokina. Uh, you know, I, I went to some of the other um, big camera shows. I spoke to the PR companies. I spoke to the brands themselves, the marketing people. And eventually I managed to get um, three companies that sponsored, uh, that, that were prepared to sponsor me for four years. And that's how I managed to propel myself uh, into these environments because it's expensive when you go there um, as, as a single person. You need a group um, of porters, a sardar who's in charge of them, a cook, and, um, uh, and over the years, I got to know that group of men very well because you're living with them. And um, it's quite strange, you know, it's the, 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 there's maybe one or two of them that have got some English, but their English isn't very good. And of course, I speak no Balti. Uh, well, you know, a few words here and there. Um, but uh, it was a, a great a, a experience to, to have the privilege of being able to photograph in you know with my own team and and be able to go where i wanted to go and when i wanted to go and capture those mountains which are absolutely spectacular these vertical towers um uh, you know you've got towers and minarets cathedrals that the the, the 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 whole nature of the landscape is vertical and and of course they shed the snow. It's not like the Himalayas that are completely white masses. Yeah. You've got these um, mountains that, that, that largely shed the snow. So you've got the rock towers coming through ridges of snow. And from a photographic perspective, they are just amazing. Quite so amazing. did you have to do a lot of hiking and walking? I mean, I'm looking at some of the photographs sitting in front of me here. And they're just splendid and they have glaciers and stuff. So... Do you fly in? Do you hike in? How do, how do you find these spots and, you know, how laborious was it? Well, <laughs> well yeah, I mean, we would normally be on the glacier for, a, for about a month. Um, so you, you're in a tent and, you know, Balti food, you know, is not particularly exciting. And, uh, but the guys were really good. You know, they, they, they would bring other, you know, foodstuffs then, you know, for meals that, that I would eat. And you know they would make fresh japatis on, on a on you know each meal, um, which were delicious. Um, but you would you would fly in from um, Islamabad. You know I would fly from from London to Islamabad, and then <clears throat> there's a a short forty five minute flight that takes you into a place called Skardu. And um, uh, the, the only downside is that if the cloud is is the cloud base is down, they won't fly because Nanga Parbat is in the flight path, which is another 8,000 meter peak. Um, <clears throat> and the alternative is a 22 hour journey by road, uh, which is, I've done it many times, but it's, it's tedious and it's very dangerous. Um, uh, but you get there and then um, you have a couple of days usually in Skardu, just getting the team together. I mean, you know, someone else doing that, but yeah just making sure everything's in place. And there's then a six hour drive into a, a place called Ascoli. And that's one of the gateways. There's two, but most of the expeditions that are going to climb K2 or any of the other 8,000 meter peaks, um, like the Gasher Brums or Broad Peak uh, are going through Ascoli. So there's a big footfall of porters that are, that are going up, mainly the Baltoro Glacier, um, to climb the 8,000 meter peaks. <laughs> When's the last time you've been there? I should have been um, this year, but obviously couldn't go. So the last time I was there was 2019. And I went to, onto the Biafo Glacier, where it's, it's really, really wild, really wild and heavily crevassed, you know, by comparison with the Baltoro Glacier, it is um, very much more dangerous, um, but absolutely stunning. The ogres there, um, which is one of the big mountains in the Karakoram, not 8,000 meters. Where can people but, see these uh, images? Uh, you have a book first off, which... Um... The book's been published in, uh, well, in the, in the US, it, it's been published at the beginning of March, so it will be available um, via bookstores and obviously Amazon um, at the beginning of March. You can pre-order it at the moment. 
um, <clears throat> but it's called the Karakoram Ice Mountains of Pakistan, and it's been published by Merrill. The pictures that you're like taking now after the book's been published and you're still going back, where, where can people see those? Um, they will go onto my website. I had planned uh, to commission a new website this year, but I'm afraid, you know, with COVID, uh, you know, like everything else, it's just been put on a hold. But um, I will um, upload a gallery on my website in, in, uh, in time for the publication of the book. I've been careful, you know, there are some pictures there on my website at the moment, but on long-term projects like this, uh, <clears throat> the danger is if, if you upload new work continuously, by the time a book comes six or seven years later, you know, people don't consider the work new because they've been looking at it for years. So I've kept, you know, the real estate off, um, off the website. Um, I know it might be counterintuitive, but I did that also with a book that was published in September called Fragile. And it just means that people are more inclined to buy the book because they haven't really, you know, in, indulged themselves in the images and they can have their own copy of the, the images in the book. For our viewers, um, in the article that we've published, um, Colin goes into some of the things in regards to the fragile in the book, uh, which is uh, pretty cool. You kind of have to see it. it's kind of a different project, you know, photographing something small and fragile and something gigantic in, you know, the the mountain book and the, the mountain images are just extraordinary. I mean, I, I wasn't really aware of that mountain range. I know it was there, but I wasn't aware of what it looked like. And it really, in some ways, you know, uh, parallels what you find in the Southern Hemisphere in the Patagonia area and some of those mountain ranges too. So uh, they're, they're quite astounding images. Um, I want to bring Colin back sometime. Maybe um, uh, we'll have a, a general discussion just on what it takes to, to do a book project because those are very difficult and, you know, you just got to get sponsors or you can self-publish. But, you know, producing a book is something I know that uh, a number of our readers have asked me to explore over, you know, the, the coming time. And I'd like to do that a little bit. Um, Colin, with all the things that have changed, obviously we've all been locked down for a year and not traveled and so forth. Um, you know, a lot of new photographers are coming up. If you were going to give a bit of advice to photographers on um, how they can develop a career or where they uh, can go or what they should do to get themselves known and, and make a living doing this kind of stuff. What's your suggestions? Well, it's a, it's a difficult question that, um, Kevin, and, you know. I don't pose easy questions. <laughs> am I best placed to give advice for up and coming photographers, um, given how much the marketplace has changed? But what, what I would say um, which I think is 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 important uh, is that you know if, if you want to follow um, you know a dream or your passion, you need to find a mechanism that allows you to do that. And um, increasingly, it's more difficult to to pay bills from professional photography. So you know, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that have studied, they've done degrees. And that's what they're qualified in, but it's how you turn images into revenue. How do you turn it into dollars? Because, you know, the currency of photography has been totally devalued. Yes. There's, I mean, it's like music. I mean, it, it, you know, no, when was the last time, you know, you bought music? You know, we all subscribe to Spotify now. Um, and, you know, we get the music we want for a subscription. But, you know, if you go back 15 years ago, you would pick up a CD and it would go into your supermarket trolley, you know, with some vacuum packed chicken. You know, it was a commodity you could buy. And photography, unfortunately, has become the same as music. It's just 10 years behind where music now is. So if you can't sell, you know, if you can't sell photographs, how do you make a living? And, and I can't answer that question. It is a very tough one. When you, can, when you consider that, you know, it's always a dream, you know, photography and photographers are romanticized uh, so often in movies and TV shows, you know, free spirit, go around shooting pictures, do what you want. And while it's really nice, 
um, and I've enjoyed a very good career in photography. But of course, a lot of that was back in the 70s, 80s. And uh, when you got paid a lot to do photography, because there was no internet, there was no email. Uh, it was not even Photoshop. You know, it was people bought your talent or they paid for your talent to, you know, do photography and you could actually make a career in photography. Um, that's pretty hard these days. Um, there's a lot of good photographers out there. I see great images. Uh, I've had the opportunity to sit down and talk to them. Many of them tell me they shoot JPEG only and they, they, they take it back and they throw it on social media or share that way. And they don't even get a chance to make a print. And of course that obviously disturbs me. Anybody that knows, um, you know, my site and what I believe in, I really don't believe you have the photograph until you got something you hold in your hand. Um, I mean, that's just the way it's always been. Um, but I think increasingly, Kevin, you know, with artificial intelligence getting placed, you know, more and more in, into products like cameras, it, you know, the, the, the craft of it is becoming irrelevant. Um, I mean, I know that if younger photographers came in my workshops, a lot of what I'm advocating is really irrelevant to them. They don't want a tripod. They're going to shoot from the hip with an image stabilizer. And we both know that a tripod kind of, hones you know it makes you commit to one spot you know you've looked around and you've said this is where the best composition is and it's commitment uh, more than anything and then you can set the camera up with a focus and the uh, uh, um, histogram and so forth but you know these things i mean a friend of mine asked me his son's doing a duke of uh, edinburgh awards um, program and he, he chose photography and he asked me if, if I would spend a bit of time and tutor him just in some basic things about photography and the, the, his son must be about 15 but you know I found it so difficult to try and explain what was going on in the camera and you know I, I actually researched YouTube and I found some tutorials that would explain you know depth of field and shutter speed and aperture and exposure triangle to him but you know he's, he's got a you know his father's bought my you know a nikon camera with a decent zoom lens and he probably doesn't really understand that you know whole that the, the, you know the whole process is based on how much light is there yep. but he probably doesn't really care it's like an iphone you know, you know, who cares what, you know, the iPhone does? You don't need to know. It produces an image. And this is where photography has gone. I mean, it's the craft part is, is, is there, but um, it's vision. And, and, you know, going back to your original question, if you feel you've got something to say um, and, and you, you want to, to develop that, it needs to be, something specific and you need to indulge yourself in that and you need to find a way that allows you to do that if it means you're going to work at another job and commit as much time as you can to that project then that's what you need to do and increasingly you, you know recreational photographers the people that come in on my workshops they've actually got more opportunities to take photographs than a lot of the young pros because they've got money They've got the money to buy the kit and they've got the money to come on a workshop with me or you or someone else. Whereas the pros don't, they don't have any of that. And they, you know, the, the, the recreational photographer, if, you know, if, if, if he or she has got that talent, they can use that your income to help them develop a passion that they have for some aspect of life. Yep. And that's, well, the, that's yeah. the challenge. It's, it is the challenge. <clears throat> you know, it's interesting. Um, as we begin to wind this down a little bit, there's a lot of photographers, young people especially, that uh, feel that they need to go back to film and that film's, you know, pure and, uh, you know, it's where they want. So they go buy a camera and shoot film and try to develop some pictures. And, you know, they, they have a niche for a while that looks pretty cool. But, you know, in the end, you know, you got to consistently be able to see, feel, and, and shoot these images and uh, make prints from these images. I think, you know, the, the print part for me is, is all about the subtlety. Um, you know, you put a nice print on the wall and you can watch people walk up to that print and look into the shadows and see the details. Like some of your mountain images that uh, you know, I've seen that uh, 
or part of the article that we, we've been talking about, you know, I can only imagine what those would look like as a 30 by 40 inch print, you know, where you can st stand back from it and you slowly walk into it and you begin to see the texture of the rock and, uh, you know, the, uh, the way the snow is, is shaped and the details that uh, go along with it. That's where, it, where true appreciation of, of photography comes. In a book, you can hold it. It's fairly big. On a wall, it's a print that you can walk into and immerse yourself into. Um, but, you know, so much of the, the photography we see on an everyday basis, and I'm as guilty as an expert. person. I post my photography on Instagram, mainly because I want people to go to my site and get better appreciation of what I'm doing, I, unfortunately, we have to sort of use social media as a way to uh, bring awareness of, of what we are up to, and then hopefully they can explore those images elsewhere. elsewhere. But there's some people that that's as far as it goes. You know, they put it on Instagram, hope they get a bunch of likes, and you know, they're they're stars. And you know, even the people selling photographs and marketing photographs and even marketing products are looking at these photographers and go. Well, I think we'll give this guy a, a camera to use because he's got, uh, you know, 550,000 followers or something. And, you know, so he should be able to, we, let's give him our camera to use. And then, you know, people want to use that same camera. You know, the whole concept of marketing and what photography is about has changed based upon just the fact that somebody's got a lot of followers. And a lot of those people buy their followers, too. So, you know, I don't think we should fool ourselves there. Um, I've certainly looked at that. I, I guess the bottom line is everything's changing. We got to change along with it. But for guys like you and me, you know, we're still about the moment, still about the the environment, still about setting our tripods up, you know, looking out over the horizon and into the, the subject and, you know, actually seeing something before we take a picture of it. Um, so. Be visualize it. Thanks. The other thing that's changing is I'm just noticing in, in my in my studio here that um, it's nearly dark outside and it's <laughs> so, <laughs> there's no light on. <laughs> You're fading away. <laughs> um, <laughs> Things aren't that tough, Kev. <laughs> well, anyway, look, we have a, a great article. That, uh, remember, the link will be on the article that uh, uh, take a look at uh, the, the work. And um, I really want to come photograph with you sometime, Colin. I believe that... Um, you know, this pandemic's going to be over. And uh, if you're anything like me, you know, I, I got a long list of places I need to catch up on. And, you know, I think that this year, you know, if it was a normal year, the places I would have actually gotten to and, you know, a lot of the people I would have met and so forth. But I think one of the things that I want to do as I move forward is, you know, go out one on one with somebody like yourself, you know, maybe someplace, you know, we take a trip to, uh, to Isle Sky or someplace and, uh, talk while we photograph, you know, like two guys playing golf and, you know, uh, carry our tripods and our cameras and, and set up and talk about, you know, our our stories and other things. So I, I hope we can get to that point and I would really be honored to, you know, have well, the opportunity. Yeah, to... My pleasure. I, I know where there's a lot of um, places off the beaten track as well. Well, that would be good. Maybe I'd come back with a picture and so forth too. Um, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have a gallery and at least one times where where people actually wanted to come to a gallery and, and walk around. Uh, it's been kind of a very quiet year that this year that way. Um, you know, that there's two joys I have. Obviously, a joy if somebody gives me a check for a photograph, but the joy <laughs> of being able to share the photographs with other people. Uh, to me, that's probably one of the most exhilarating pieces and things that I can do is to, to be able to share my art, even if you just come up and say, well, I've never seen photography like this before. You know, it's amazing work. At least there is a, a point where somebody's beginning to see something and appreciate it and become aware of, of, of that work. I mean, we do it. I don't know if you do it, but while I like to get paid and be able to make a living doing what I'm doing and doing fairly well that way, there's still something about just being there and doing it and being able to share it with others. And to me, to me, that's kind of why I do Photo PXL. You know, it's a, obviously it's an opportunity to share a lot of people's wealth and knowledge with a, a big community. And that's important I, to me. I agree um, with everything you say there, and particularly about the, 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 end, the end game really being the print, whether it's in a book or whether it's on the wall. Because I think if you've got um, printed matter, you interact with photography in a very different way than you do on a screen. 
and for me, it was one of the reasons that um, that uh, you know that I became a photographer because at school I was quite good at art, and and the reason that I know I was quite good at art was because there was someone that was brilliant at art, and I recognised that this guy had talent that I didn't have. He had that innate talent to draw that, I mean, I could probably have got better if I'd practiced and practiced, but it, he had that. It was innate. And and that was, you know, I thought, well, I can't really be, be an artist. And it was, you know, when I was 23 that I discovered photography. But, you know, it, it's 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 the ability to work in two dimensions. And, and, and you know, the, the end product is on a print. It's on a bit of flat paper, the way that, you know, people are going to sketch or are going to paint. Um, and that, that really, for me, is what photography will remain. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of see photography at the moment moving off in another direction. And I'm not trying to catch it um, be, because I, I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't think there's a pot of gold at the end of it. If, if, if I did, I'd be at the front end of it. But <laughs> it's moving off in another direction. Yeah. And I'm just letting it, I'm letting it happen um, because... I kind of see how I'm going to, you know, live out and fulfill what I want to do, you know, over the, the next, you know, five to 10 years of my career. Um, and um, ultimately, my work will, will end up in, in print uh, in books. I mean, the Karakoram will be the ninth book that I've done in my life. And I've got one more left in me before I fall out the tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's good. Well, look, we, we could probably talk forever, but uh, I want to say thank you very much. Um, we'll much obviously pleasure. talk again and meet. And uh, don't forget, everybody, that there's an article that uh, uh, the link for will be uh, in the in this article. You probably even have read it by now, but uh, meeting Colin and talking to him and sharing a lot of things. We had a chance to talk before we actually you know, did this talk. Um, it just goes to show that there's an awful lot of us out there that still appreciate the art of photography and where it's going and, you know, try to preserve that whole thing. And of course, we're all itching to get back out and begin our career again and shooting magnificent landscapes and traveling comfortably. Uh, that's coming. So, you know, hopefully there'll be some sort of normalcy again in the next few months. But uh, Colin, your work is amazing. Your, the books, especially fragile and, you know, the, 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 your latest book are just uh, incredible. Links will be in the article and, of course, with this video and, and article also. And um, I look forward to seeing more work and hopefully we, you know, another article or two from you sharing your craft and uh, what you've done in your career. It's been quite amazing and um, you seem to be quite happy. And seeing how the sun has gone down and we, we're, 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 you're fading out, I would hope as a good, good old Scottish guy that you're about to go and... Uh, have Let that evening drink and <laughs> enjoy yourself. <Let> <laughs> so, sorry uh, about that. And I know. Just suddenly realized how dark it's got in here. Yeah. I, I, I mean, normally I work in here on the screen. It's probably like yourself. I don't. Have, I don't use the lights because they're, they're, they're slightly yellow. So I usually kill the lights if I'm on screen. Um, but uh, I think we could do with them right now. Yeah, I think you need to get a little lighting set up for, for <laughs> Zoom calls. And things. Well, look, thank you again very much. Any last parting words that you want to share with the audience? Just follow your passion. That, that's what photography is about. Um, and don't give up. I mean, you know, if you feel you've got something to say, find a way to do it. It's not easy. It's really not easy. Um, and increasingly, you know, I don't really feel that I'm the best person to give advice on how to make a living as a photographer going forward. Well, the thing is, Kevin, I don't know who is because yeah. I don't know where it's going. No, I don't. It, it, it's just how do you get how do you get money back out of images apart from print and books? Well, maybe we'll try to figure out that secret next. Well, we could make a fortune. <laughs> yeah, I know. We get the well, answer. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. All right, everybody. Well, look, Colin, thanks very much for being part of it. To all my followers uh, on YouTube and readers on the Photo PXL site, uh, thank you for being part of this also. Thanks for being part of our community. And we're really working hard to enhance your vision. And uh, I hope you like what you're doing. And we've got a lot more coming. Take care. <laughs>